So without any further ado, let me start the evening off by introducing our keynote speaker. We're really excited and pleased to welcome Eben Upton. Uh, Eben is the founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation and a distinguished engineer with Broadcom, a Fortune 500 semiconductor company. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit, but the Raspberry Pi is truly revolutionary in terms of bringing computing uh, at low cost to lots and lots of people. So we're really, really excited. Uh, in an earlier life, he founded two successful mobile games and middleware companies, IdeaWorks 3D, now Marmalade, and PodFun held the post of Director of Studies for Computer Science at St. John's College, Cambridge, and wrote the Oxford Rhyming Dictionary with his father, Professor Clive Upton. He holds a BA, a PhD, and an MBA from the University of Cambridge, and we're really excited to welcome him here tonight. Evan. Thank you so much. Um, so, so yes, my name's, uh, my name's Eben Upton. I, I work for a little local semiconductor company that you may have heard of called Broadcom. Um, but I've spent, um, I've spent quite a lot of the last few years doing something rather different, which is uh, this, uh, this charity that we started in Cambridge called Raspberry Pi. Now, I thought I'd spend a bit of time um, uh, really just telling the story of Raspberry Pi because it's been kind of an unusual journey for me as an engineer. Um, and then later on, I might try and draw some, I might maybe try and draw one or two lessons. Uh, from the experience that we've had. So, let's see. When I was, when I was 10 years old, um, I, I went to a school that had this thing in the corner of every classroom called a BBC microcomputer. I don't know if there are any, any Brits in the room who come across a thing called a BBC, BBC micro, little beige, there we are, a little beige box called the BBC micro. So the, the BBC micro is a funny thing. It's a, um, a, a microcomputer. It was launched in 1981. It was sponsored by our national broadcaster in the UK. So we actually had a kind of a national computer in the UK. And these things, it was a beige box, a light bit microcomputer. Um, and it sat in the corner of classrooms. Um, and it was largely, it wasn't actually used to teach computing. It was largely used to do other things. It was largely used to run, you know, uh, French teaching software or English teaching software. Um, but like a lot of 8-bit micros, it had this wonderful property that you turn it on and it goes beep. It has this lovely two-turn beep that I still recognize when you turn it on. Um, and the very first thing it does is give you a programming prompt. It gives you a basic prompt. And kind of the, the interesting thing, this is really shared with all of those BBC micros and this, the machines in this country like the Apple II and the Trash 80, the Commodore 64. You turn them on, they give you a basic prompt. And if you want to do something other than program them, then you, the, the first thing you have to choose, you have to choose not to program them. Um, and what this means is it's that kind of idea of choice architecture that um, pretty much everybody my age in the UK who went to, went to school about the same time as me could at least write that two line computer program, you know, 10 print I am the best, 20 go to 10. Or uh, 10 print something much filthier than that, 20 go to 10. And you know, we used to do this. We used to go to our local, you know, our local equivalent of Best Buy or CompUSA uh, and type this into all the machines. And then hit, because that, that program is the same in all dialects of basic. And um, we type this into all the machines and then we hit enter on all the machines and then run out and then stand there against the windows as the, all the clerks in the store would run up and down trying to turn the machines off. Um, and this was, this was cool, and this, this didn't lead to everybody my age in the UK or everybody my age in the US um, becoming a computer programmer, but it did mean that we all had a chance to discover whether computer programming was, was something that we were excited about. And quite a lot of us did discover it was something we were excited about. Now, 1996, I turned up at the University of Cambridge. Now, University of Cambridge is, um, is one of those schools that has the... There are probably about 10 schools in the world in the US, mostly in the US and the UK, that have some kind of claim to have developed the first computer. Um, and then they have some really complicated, specious argument as to why theirs was the first and everybody else's wasn't the first. Now, Cambridge is, I'll, I'll bore you with Cambridge's explanation. Um, Cambridge was the first university to produce a computer which was used substantially by people who weren't the people who had developed the computer. So it was the. <laughs> I did say, I said I was going to bore you. Uh, you were already bored. Um, so so um, I mean, in practice, what this meant, this was the late 1940s. In practice, what this meant was the Department of Chemistry um, in the University of Cambridge was busy cranking out Nobel Prizes in the late 40s and early 50s using X-ray crystallography, was able, to, was able to buy time on a computer. It was computing as a service in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, 
So Cambridge is one of the, you know, it's one of the best places in the world to study computing. Uh, and when I turned up there in 1996, you had to fight your way over an enormous pile of other people to get a place. So we admit about, we, we admitted then, and we still admit now, about 80 people a year to read computer science at the university. Uh, and at the point I applied, we had about 600 applicants for those 80 places. And that's pretty typical for Cambridge. I'm sure it's pretty typical for a school like UCI as well. You know, intense competition to get into the best um, engineering schools. Um, and... That was great, and I had a wonderful time. Um, and about 10 years later, I'd done a doctorate, uh, and I got this job, as, um, as Dean Stern mentioned, I, I, I had a job uh, called Director of Studies, and the Director of Studies in the subject is responsible for going out and is responsible for organizing the undergraduate teaching in the subject, and is also responsible for going out and finding more undergraduates. So you're responsible for going out and talking to high schools and explaining to people why your subject is the best, um, and you're responsible for interviewing. And we have this interviewing procedure in December, which is incredibly brutal. We get these kids in, and we, we really brutalize them. And I was really looking forward to it, because uh, I'd been brutalized in 1996. I'm like, OK, the boot's on the other foot now. I can, uh, I can brutalize some 18-year-olds. And um, it was the first week of December in 2004. And it was, it was a profoundly depressing experience, because I'd expected to have a whole week of fun brutalizing 18-year-olds. And I, I had an afternoon. Uh, our numbers had collapsed. And what we'd seen between 1996 and 2004 was a decline from about 600 people wanting to come, wanting our 80 places to under 250. We were down to a ratio of maybe two and a half, two and a half to one, five to two, um, which by Cambridge standards is catastrophic. Um, these were still bright people. Uh, we were still able to find enough people to fill our course. But it was starting to look a little bit dicey. You know, it was starting to look like if this trend carried on for more than a few more years, then we were going to have to consider shrinking the size of our intake in order to maintain our quality. Um, and a group of us at the university sat down and, and asked ourselves uh, uh, what might have caused this. And what we happened on was, well, we asked ourselves where our recruits had come from. And of course, all of our recruits in the 1990s had come through exactly the same route that I had come from. We don't really teach computing, or at least then, we didn't really teach computing in schools. What we relied on was a stream of um, people who had effectively taught themselves um, that computing was something they were interested in. This isn't a problem the physicists have. This isn't a problem the mathematicians have. Um, if you are at school and you're good at physics, it doesn't take an enormous leap of the imagination to think, I want to do some more of that. You know? Particularly um, here, where it costs money to go to, you know, to go to university. In the UK, I actually was paid by the government to go to the university. Back in the 1990s, they used to pay us. Now, it's much more like the United States. People have to pay to go to university. Um, but it doesn't take a giant leap of imagination to go do more of something that you're really enjoying. Um, to go and study computer science at university, or to go and study engineering for that matter. You know, we don't really in the UK teach anything. We don't even have in the UK anything similar to the idea of shop class that you have here that gives you some sort of exposure to engineering um, at school level. Um, engineering and computer science suffer from a lack of a pipeline, a lack of a natural academic pipeline to bring these students in. Um, and our hypothesis, and it remains a hypothesis, you know, we're nearly 10 years into doing Raspberry Pi now, and our hypothesis was and remains um, that we'd been benefiting from this kind of informal pipeline, that the availability of cheap, um, accessible computing in children's bedrooms, effectively, uh, in the corners of schoolrooms and in children's bedrooms, um, was, provo was, was um, providing us with a, an alternative route into engineering subjects. Um, and of course, what happened in the 1990s was those machines went away. You know, those 8-bit microcomputers were not succeeded by an equivalently programmable set of 16- and 32-bit microcomputers. They were largely succeeded for a lot of children by games consoles. We have these devices now which are massively powerful in all of our pockets. You know, compared to the machine that I had, my 2 megahertz BBC Micro that I had back in the 1980s, um, my phone is an enormously powerful computer, but it's also a completely closed platform. You know, you can, you can write programs for your phone, but you can't write programs on your phone. What that means is that people are no longer lured into the, the choice architecture has been inverted. We've gone from a world in which you had, your machine was by default programmable, and to do anything other than programming, you had to choose not to program, to an environment in which um, your device is by default not programmable, and you have to choose, if you're lucky, you have a machine like a PC, which is programmable. Um, but you have to, even on the PC, you now have to choose to go out and get those tools. You have to choose to become a programmer. So the hypothesis with Raspberry Pi was that we had, um, um, the increase in the usability 
of computers, which is, of course, a wonderful thing. You know, a vast number more people are able to benefit from you know, having powerful computers in their lives than, than ever could before. Um, but that what we've lost is well, that was that unintended consequence of the unusability of 1980s computers, which is this stream of kind of free, self-trained young people who've discovered off of their own accord that they want to be engineers. Um, so what happened? Um, we tried to build something, and we had this idea that if only we could build a machine which was cheap, we wanted a thing which cost about the same as a school textbook. We know that schools can uh, ask their students to buy textbooks, so if we could make a machine which cost the same as a textbook, that felt like there wouldn't be barriers to access. We wanted a device which was robust, that could be put into a school bag and taken out. We believe very strongly that children should own their computers. Uh, we don't believe in class sets of Raspberry Pis. We believe in children owning them and putting them in their school bag at the end of the day. We wanted a device which was fun, because we had to remember that those machines that we bought in the 1980s, we didn't necessarily buy them for, uh, you know, um, because they were worthy machines. I, I bought my BBC. I did buy my BBC Migrator program, but I was a big geek. Um, most people um, got their machines to play games on, or they were bought their machines by their parents to do schoolwork on. They were not bought them as programming tools. So we wanted something which was useful as something other than a programming tool. And of course, we wanted a machine which was programmable. We wanted a machine which we could bundle every programming tool you've ever heard of um, on. And um, we tried a lot of things. Um, my earliest prototype was in uh, built in 2006, actually, almost exactly a decade ago, just before I joined Broadcom. Um, and it was broadly as powerful as those machines in the 1980s. It met the price target, and it met the programmability target. And it was fairly robust, um, but it wasn't any fun. And it wasn't any fun because it was about as powerful as the 1980s computer, and it's unrealistic to expect children to find, these, uh, to find a machine which is only as powerful as an Apple II exciting in this day and age. So um, we tried a lot of things. Uh, I joined Broadcom. Um, and well, one thing I discovered when I joined Broadcom was that Broadcom had a bunch of chips that I could use to build exactly this sort of thing. Um, by 2008, we had something that we thought was plausible. Um, it was a little machine that uh, only ran Python. Um, we started a foundation. We wanted what to call the foundation. And we thought, well, um, fruit named computer companies are good. There's a lot of fruit named computer companies. <laughs> um, and uh, most of the fruits are taken. There are so many fruit named computer companies, aren't that many left. Um, so so we, picked, we picked one. And we picked, of course, Raspberry because I don't know if this is the case in the, the do you say blah, blah, Raspberry in the, like, pfft. That thing, right? You say that, right? Okay. So raspberry is the rudest fruit, and that is literally why we're called raspberry. Um, and we had a machine which just ran Python. It, all it did booted into Python the same way your Commodore 64 boots into Basic. And so we thought Pi, Pi, Raspberry Pi, that'd be kind of fun. So we we called it. We we founded a charitable foundation called Raspberry Pi. Um, we then decided we didn't like the thing we'd made. We decided it wasn't general purpose enough. Um, in particular, it lacked a um, it lacked the ability to run Linux. Now, the ability to run Linux was kind of trans transformative for us because it allowed us to leverage that enormous amount of work that's gone into the Linux platform. Um, so we tried a bunch of other stuff. Very fortunately, a Broadcom chip came along that happened to have all the features that we wanted, plus an ARM, which allowed us to run Linux. And so really, by 2011, we had something which you would recognize as a Raspberry Pi. But we were kind of dawdling along. You know, this is already, this was, you know, we had the realization in 2004, this was 2011. We'd been dawdling along for kind of seven years. Um, and because many of us are very attached to the whole BBC Micro idea, many of us who were involved in Raspberry Pi had BBC Micros. We really wanted to call it BBC Micro. And we kept going to see the BBC. Uh, and the BBC kept saying, oh, no, 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 we can't, we can't, we can't do this. No, no, sorry, European Union competition law or some spurious explanation like that. And we went to see a guy called Rory Catherine Jones, who's a BBC uh, technology correspondent, whose wife, I believe, is a trustee of the BBC. <clears throat> we thought he'd be perfect because he was a journalist and he had family connections to, to management. And he said no as well. And this is in May. This is, this is pretty much exactly five years ago in, in, in May 2011. But what he did say was, could I put it? Uh, it sounds like a great idea. Could I take a video of you and put it on my blog? Um, and he, um, uh, he did. Um, and we were idiots. We said yes, because we didn't know what this meant. Um, and he, we got 600,000 YouTube views in two days for this. People love this idea so much. 600,000 YouTube views in two days. And I didn't do a lot of work at Broadcom those two days. I just, uh, I just sat at YouTube pressing F5 and watching my how popular are you counter kind of winding up. Um, and and I, <laughs> my head was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and and I, went, I went home. I had to go through the door sideways. Um, and uh, and my, um, I sat down, the second day, sat down uh, opposite my wife Liz for dinner. And we looked at each other across the table. And we realized that we'd promised 
to build 600,000 people a um, $25 computer, and we had not the faintest idea how to do that. <laughs> and this is the ultimate oh shit moment. Um, so, so I had a very bu busy 20, <laughs> 2011. I um, uh, first trying to figure out, we had a back of an envelope calculation. It's one of these wonderful engineering back of an envelope calculations where you go, well, if I add up the cost of the Broadcom chip and the RAM, uh, that's a lot less than $25. So I'll be able to make it for $25. And what we forgot, of course, is that a device like Raspberry Pi, even the original Raspberry Pi, has about 180 components apart from the RAM and the Broadcom chip. Um, and most of those components cost a tenth of a cent. They're mostly you know, the dust, um, passives, resistors, little tiny surface mount resistors and capacitors. But quite a lot of them, tens of them, are not those things. Tens of them are things, things like HDMI connectors. I had no idea how much an HDMI can. I now know more about how much HDMI connectors cost in various places in the world than I ever wanted to know. Um, but it turns out, actually, if you start adding up those components, you very, it's those things that kill you. It's those things that, so I had a very busy 2011 trying to figure out how to get cheap HDMI connectors. I, I mortgaged my house and used it to buy chips. Um, I found a Chinese contract manufacturer with some help from a, a Broadcom employee in Taipei. Um, I, I mortgaged my house. I, I bought, you can't send chips very easily to Shenzhen, which is where we were manufacturing them. What you do is you send them to Hong Kong and they move them across the border. Um, I mortgaged my house, spent all the money on chips, and then sent them to a transshipment point in Hong Kong. And the contract manufacturer was so small, the transshipment point was a um, was an apartment. And so, I, so half the money went on chips, and the other half got wire transferred to this guy. Um, and then I had this horrible, uh, this horrible waiting game. They said it would be three. It'd be three weeks, and then it didn't turn up after three weeks. And then it was Chinese New Year, and then I said nothing happens. And then another three weeks, and then and then ten of these turn up in a box. One of them looks like it's been stamped on, um, and the other nine they start up, but the Ethernet doesn't work because they forgot to put any transformers in the Ethernet path. Um, so, but remarkably, we got there. Um, we launched on the 29th of February 2012. Um, Partway through this, we, we realized that there was no way you're mortgaging your house and using it to buy chips, selling product, getting your money back, buying more chips is not a scalable way to grow a business. Uh, so we so we took a leaf we took a leaf out of uh, Arm's book. We have a company in Cambridge that's become quite successful called Arm. Uh, and they're, of course, they don't make things. They're an IP licensing company. They design things and then license the designs to other companies, including Broadcom, um, to, to, to use to build chips. And so what we decided we wanted to be, we wanted to be an IP licensing company. Um, and that's really been the, the you know, that uh, of all things has been the, the, the big thing that's underpinned the success of Raspberry Pi is although we're a not-for-profit, we can't raise money, uh, we can't raise capital by selling shares. Um, by becoming an IP licensing company, it took us out of the working capital loop. So, so where are we? We're four years in. We've launched three generations of Raspberry Pi. Um, they all cost between $20 and $35. Um, last year, we launched a little thing called Raspberry Pi Zero, which is a $5 computer, which has been flying off the shelves and gone very well. I hope some of you have been able to get your hands on them. They're still in kind of short supply. Um, uh, we've been able to buy, we sold 9 million of the big Raspberry Pis. Right? We thought we were going to sell 1,000. We thought if we sold 1,000 to the right 1,000 kids, we could solve our recruitment problems. So we're, we're uh, five, four orders of magnitude north of where we expect it to be. Um, because we've done that, we're actually able, the Raspberry Pi was, making the Raspberry Pi hardware was supposed to be our contribution, right? By selling so many Raspberry Pis, the Raspberry Pi Foundation now has a charitable endowment that it can use to do much more traditional charitable activities. You know, we pay for teacher training, we produce a vast number of, of, of online resources. And the number of applicants to computer science at Cambridge last year was 800. So we are a third, we're 30% above in our applicants, 30% above where we were at the height of the dot-com boom. And that's a really encouraging, that's a really encouraging place to be. So it's been kind of a wild ride, and it's been a wild ride for an engineer. Right, I'm an engineer, I was sitting in a dark room and write computer programs. Um, it's been a wild ride because I have to go and stand on stage and do things like this. Um, one of the problems, I'm just going to just, um, um, I've got a couple of minutes left maybe. Um, one of the problems with successful, with success, is that people who, have, we, I think we've been successful. When people are successful, they try and draw lessons from their success. And I think that's always really dubious because a lot of what happened was luck. And I could just stand up here and say my advice to you is to be lucky, uh, like Raspberry Pi was lucky. And it's not a bad piece of advice. Um, I did write down some things I was going to suggest you should do, but then I've crammed them in. Ah, here we are. Okay. Um, three things. Um, 
I hope some of you have a chance to do something that's as awesome as Raspberry Pi because it's been brilliant. Um, if you do, try and do audacious things, right? Um, you know, mortgage your house and buy chips and send them to China. You know, you might get away with it, particularly if you're lucky. Um, but you know, try and do audacious things. You know, it's it's you know we've we've uh, you know we've 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 done a lot of surprising stuff with Raspberry Pi. We've gone to a lot of surprising places. Uh, afterwards, I'll hang around afterwards, and I, I can I can tell you engineering war stories that turn your hair white. Um, but you know, we've had a great time doing it. So audacity is good. Um, but the next one, I, the next one, be conservative. Um, so one of the things, yeah. So, so <laughs> having told you about like mortgaging my house, um, no, be be conservative. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things about Raspberry Pi, I said we've done three generations of Raspberry Pi: Raspberry Pi One, Raspberry Pi Two, Raspberry Pi Three. One of the things that's really marked that out is the is the extent to which we've tried to change very small amounts of stuff between generations. We're all engineers here, you know. We like to do um, crazy stuff. I just told you to be audacious. We like to do crazy things. Engineers like new stuff. Engineers like magpies. They like shiny things, right? Um, the temptation with something like Raspberry Pi would be to make Raspberry Pi Two wildly different and much better in every way, to start from scratch every time. Um, starting from scratch in engineering is almost always the wrong thing to do. If you have something that works, try to pick one thing that doesn't or that you're not quite happy with and change that. Uh, incrementalism and conservatism is the heart of good engineering. And finding that balance between audacity and conservatism is you know, how you do this stuff. Um, and the last one's be persistent. I mean, this has been a long journey, 2004 to 2016. Uh, the first two thirds of that time, we had no product. Right, be persistent. There were days, you know, find people, again, be lucky. Have people in your life who will help you be persistent. I remember, particularly my family members, I have I've had a wonderful chance to work with my, with my wife uh, on this. Um, my parents, my wife, my friends, there were periods of time during the Raspberry Pi story where I did not believe in Raspberry Pi. Um, but there was always at least one person who kept believing. Uh, and you know, be lucky. If you, if if I encourage you to be lucky in one way, have people in your lives who'll help you be persistent. Um, I just leave you with one thing. Um, the one of my old tutors at Cambridge, um, one of my old tutors at Cambridge, uh, told me there's a there's kind of a mistake people make about education. Um, they think that the point of education is to give young people the benefit of knowledge, uh, and he said that's that's completely wrong. The point of education is to give knowledge to the benefit of young people. Um, you know, the, you know, we, we have. You're, you're, you are incredibly lucky. As you in the audience who are students, you're incredibly lucky to be at an institution like this and having the opportunity to study engineering here. Um, but engineering is incredibly lucky to have you. Right, engineering is incredibly lucky that people like you have chosen to give up years of your lives to train to become engineers. We are confronted with enormous challenges in the UK as a country. You're confronted with enormous challenges here in the US. Uh, we're confronted with enormous challenges as a species. And it is engineers, it's people like you, who are the people who are going to solve those, those, those problems. So I just thought I'd conclude by thanking you for giving me the opportunity, thanking um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here with you. Really looking forward to seeing some of your stuff later on. And yeah, go do audacious stuff conservatively. Thank you. Please give another round of applause to Evan Upton. Look. The Raspberry Pi is a cool machine, and uh, we use them extensively on campus. Our students use them in undergraduate projects. Uh, you, you all are sitting in front of history now, because with a $5 computer, a $5 computer, everybody in the world will have access. And when everybody in the world has access, that's when audacious things happen, not just here, but everywhere in the world. And that is a cool thing. Please give them another round of applause. <clears throat> and not only that, in his spare time, he doubles as the transporter. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the students know what I'm talking about. <laughs>